This is New Amsterdam Photo Video, and in this tutorial, I'll demonstrate how to make a DIY turntable for 360 product photography and video. I've been using this method for a while now for my 360 shots, and it works very well. The process is completely manual, so there's no motors involved. It only takes a few minutes to photograph and edit, and it's a very inexpensive alternative to buying motorized turntables and software. The process is like a stop-motion animation, where you take several images and make them into an image sequence for a video, or you can use a fewer images for an interactive 360 photo gallery. To get started, you'll need a few items. First, you'll need this Lazy Susan from Ikea, which they call the Snooda. You can find this at any Ikea store or on their website. They're very affordable and they cost around $10, and they're perfect for using for 360 photography. You'll also need some sheets of construction paper. I like using 24 by 36 sheets from Staples or any other office supply store that you like. They can be used on the table and as a background. Next, you'll need a cloth tape measure that measures in centimeters, which has to be at least 130 centimeters long. You'll also need a shutter remote for whichever camera that you use. The camera needs to be on a tripod so you can reduce any shaking in between images. You might also need some additional small items, like a glue gun or a sticky putty, as well as some tape. I find that for smaller items, you need something to get them to stick in place, and these work really well. The IKEA Lazy Susan is perfect to use as a photo turntable. There's a lot of ball bearings, which give it a very smooth movement. There's also a rubber grip on the bottom, so it always stays in place. And the solid wood gives it some good weight, so it doesn't shake around a lot between shots. The concept for the turntable is very simple. Using the cloth tape measure, you want to attach it to the outer rim of the turntable. This gives exact reference points around the turntable, so you can get even spacing between images when turning the turntable. Attach the tape measure to the outer rim of the turntable, starting with the end of the tape measure. I'll put a piece of clear tape every 20 centimeters or so as I make my way around. Wrap the tape measure around itself until you get to the beginning. This particular tape measure has a little bit extra hanging in front, so I'll just clip it right off and make a marking indicating where the measurement starts. With the tape measure attached, we now have accurate markings around the turntable. I use a little stick as a reference point to match to the markings, but you can use a pen cap or a paper clip. Looking at the tape measure, line up the markings on the measure to your reference point, and then take a picture then rotate the turntable to the next reference point. For video, I'll take an image every half centimeter or so. You need a lot of images to give a smooth rotation. For photo galleries, I'll take an image every 5 or 10 centimeters, since you only need about 20 to 30 images in a full rotation. To give the turntable a white surface, I trace it on a piece of construction paper and cut out a large white circle to cover it. You can put sticky putty underneath to keep it in place. For my particular setup, I have a small table that I shoot on with a roll of seamless white backdrop paper taped to the table. I use this foam core piece on top of the table to make the table completely white since it's sturdier than the paper. Then I place the turntable on the white foam core, with the white circle of construction paper on the turntable. For lighting, I have three soft boxes, one directly above and two that go on the sides. Centering your object is very important when you want to start shooting your 360. You want to find the center axis of the turntable and have the object sitting directly in that center axis. If the item is off-center, it'll be very noticeable. Here, you can see a comparison of an item that is centered and one that is off-center. Finding the center isn't an exact science. I typically place the item where I think the center is and spin the turntable, watching the item. Look closely at it spinning and watch for the center that it's spinning around. I make small adjustments and keep spinning until the object looks centered. It's not the most exact way, but it's worked for me so far. To make a 360 video with this setup, you'll need to take about 244 images. Now this sounds like a lot, but it's very necessary for giving a smooth rotation. This is one of my older DIY turntables with tape measure along the outside. You can see that the tape measure wraps fully around the turntable, measuring the circumference at about 122 centimeters. Since I take one image every time I rotate the turntable half a centimeter, 
I end up with 244 images for a full 360 rotation. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison that I made, showing why I use 244 images for video. On the left, you can see a 360 video with one image taken every centimeter, with the video on the right showing the video with an image taken every half centimeter. The movement on the longer clip is much smoother. For video, you want as many frames as possible in a full rotation. I found that one image every half centimeter works best for me, but you can cut that down even further to get more frames. To start shooting the 360, make sure your item is centered on the turntable. Frame up your shot so the item is centered in the frame and spin the turntable a few times to make sure the rotation looks okay. Check that your tripod and table are secured. You don't want any bumps while taking the images. When you're ready to start, line up the turntable at the starting marker and start shooting. I keep my hand in place and gently move the turntable a half centimeter, pausing for a second, then taking the photo. This process takes a few minutes, but for the results, it's definitely worth it. You'll find that you get into the groove and it becomes very easy. You develop a muscle memory when moving the turntable along. When I make one complete rotation, I'll actually continue shooting and rotating another third of the way. I found it's good to have some overlap so you can have some room to adjust where the rotation starts. Here you can see the final result of the 360. Each rotation is a little over 10 seconds long, but the movement is nice and smooth, and the loop on the rotation is seamless. This technique will work with a variety of items, and you can reverse the footage to have it spin in the opposite direction. One thing I want to cover quickly is depth of field and flickering. When I started making 360 videos, I noticed there was a flickering issue where there would be a slight change in exposure in between each shot, which caused the image to flicker in the shadows. I realized this occurred on images I had taken with a smaller aperture, but not on images that I photographed wide open. With most modern cameras, when the shutter is fired, the lens aperture will close down to your desired f-stop, and then reopen. Now this will happen between each photo. Each time the aperture closes down, there's microscopic variances in the diameter of the aperture that will cause variances in the exposure from shot to shot. There's a few tricks to avoid this flickering issue, like using older lenses that can stop down and they do not change between shots. Obviously, you want a larger depth of field, depending on the item, so it's entirely in focus, but you want to avoid any flickering. One trick that works for this, as well as for time lapses, is to hold down the depth of field preview button on your camera. Then release the lens slightly so the contacts do not touch. This will keep the aperture closed down, but it's a little risky to keep your lens loose while shooting. Now that you've shot your 360, it's time to process the images. There's a variety of ways to do this, and it really depends on what programs you prefer to use or have available. I typically like using Adobe Bridge or Lightroom, then QuickTime, and then Adobe Premiere. I'll briefly go over how I process my images for both video and photo use. After downloading all of the raw images from the camera, open them up in Adobe Bridge. You can use Lightroom as well, I just like using Bridge. Here, you can see all of the images that were photographed. Select all of the images with Command-A on a Mac or Control-A on a PC, and then open the images in Camera Raw. There's a small symbol at the top of Bridge for Camera Raw, or you can press Command-R on a Mac or Control-R on a PC. Select all of the images in Camera Raw by pressing Command-A on Mac or Control-A on PC, and go to the Crop Settings. I crop my images to 9x16, which is the aspect ratio for HD video footage. You can crop your 360 photos however you choose. Set your cropping area and hit enter so the same crop settings are applied to all of the images. Here, you can tweak the color temperature and exposure settings. I'll push up the exposure a bit to blow out the background and increase the contrast. When you feel the images are set, select all of the images and go to Save Images in the bottom left. This will bring the Save Options menu. I like to name the images a three-digit serial number, starting with 001. I'll save all of the images as JPEGs and set the image sizing to 1920 by 1080 to use for video. Select the destination folder for the images and click Save. I have 310 images to process, which will take just a few minutes. 
A full rotation is 244 images, but I shoot one in a third rotation so I can have some wiggle room to adjust the rotation in Premiere. Once all of the images are saved, I'll open QuickTime to assemble the images into an image sequence. Now this can also be done easily in After Effects and Premiere, and I'll go over this in another video. In QuickTime, click File and go to Open Image Sequence. Go to the folder with your saved images and select the first image in the sequence, which will be image 001. Next, select your image sequence frame rate. There's a variety of frame rates to choose from. I typically use 24 frames per second. Press OK and then QuickTime will compile the images together. Now we have video footage of our 360 image sequence, so it's time to export the footage. Go to File, then Export to open the export settings. Select your save destination and your file name. I'll call this file 360 Elephant. Next, go to the Options button at the bottom of the menu, which will open the Movie Settings. The first button is Settings, which will choose how you want to export the footage. I always use Apple ProRes 422HQ. Now go to the Size button to make sure you're exporting it at the right image size. Click on Dimensions and use 1920 by 1080 HD. Hit OK and you're ready to export your footage. I like using QuickTime because it's a really quick and easy method of compiling the image sequence. In the time it takes me to make the footage in QuickTime, I'm still waiting for After Effects to open and load up. Once the file is exported, you now have proper footage of the 360. I'll drag the 360 footage into Adobe Premiere and place it onto my timeline to check the loop making sure that the footage loops seamlessly. Cut the footage at 10 seconds and 4 frames, then just copy and paste the footage a few times to make a loop. Play back the footage and watch the playhead as it passes the cutting mark. You want to make sure the footage loops seamlessly. Looking at it frame by frame, you can see that it loops perfectly. I like shooting extra rotations on the 360 so I can pick and choose my starting frame, in case I want a different angle on the item starting the rotation. When processing interactive image galleries, you only need a few images to put together instead of the 200 for the video. Here, I took every 10th frame from the video and put them in a separate folder, giving me about 25 images. I'll load these images onto Megavisor.com, which is a free online image program that you can use to put your 360 images on your website or share with others. Megavisor is very easy to use. Simply click Create Object at the top. Next. Select the files that you want to upload for the 360 image. Once the files are loaded, you can instantly see the interactive gallery. You can click and drag around to see how the image will be displayed, and Megavisor gives you a variety of controls to help customize the 360 image further. Now these are simple processing techniques for 360 images, and I will share a more in-depth workflow in a future video. 360 photography is becoming more and more popular, and a lot of the motorized options are very expensive. This method has worked well for me for my own 360 images, as well as 360 video. This is a very inexpensive method that takes minimal effort for a really high quality result. If you have any questions about using this method or need some help, feel free to ask. This is New Amsterdam Photo Video, and if you found this tutorial helpful, please like, comment, and subscribe.